excited to be able to turn over uh, the talk next to Dr. Andrew Smith, uh, who will be talking about some very important topics in MS, pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, and menopause in MS. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Dr. Nicholas. So first, before I go into pre-pregnancy, pregnancy, and uh, menopause with MS, I would just like to discuss that you know, we've known for a long time that multiple sclerosis appears to affect men and women differently. For whatever, uh, for many reasons, um, the prevalence of multiple sclerosis is higher in women. Some say suggest two to one to three to one favoring um, it being more common in women. Typically, MS has more relapses and onsets earlier in women. And typically, they will have more inflammatory lesions, whereas men will typically have faster progression, worse outcomes, greater shrinkage of the brain or atrophy, as Dr. Eubanks described, and more kind of destructive T1 lesions. And there's a lot of reasons why we think that um, there is a gender bias. Some has to do with the difference in hormones between men and women. It looks like the estrogen levels in uh, premenopausal non-pregnant women um, at the relative low levels during that state actually kind of shift the T cells towards a more pro-inflammatory state. And that's one of the reasons why we think the disease is a little bit more inflammatory. Women are more likely to carry certain genes um, than men are. And additionally, there are certain genes that are expressed or means that they are essentially um, or used more and differently in women compared to men. Um, and that kind of leads to some of the many reasons why we think that the disease is more inflammatory in uh, women versus men. So we noticed for a while that the gender bias had been worsening for about 60 years. It's since stabilized for the past about 20 years or so. Back in the 1940s, they used to say the odds of multiple sclerosis between the genders was even. And one of the things that they really think drove this increase in gender bias, uh, where women are more frequently involved with MS, kind of has to do with the rapid urbanization of the late 20th century, where people essentially weren't outside as much. You know, most people were going, had, taking jobs in offices, they weren't getting as much natural sunlight. Uh, people were having children later in life, which we also think affects the risk. Uh, in the later half of the 20th century, the rate of smoking actually increased in women compared to men. So there's a lot of things that we think um, kind of interacted that increased the gender bias in women that has since stabilized. So multiple sclerosis appears to affect women um, differently depending on how old they are. So the first uh, line going across is the prevalence of multiple sclerosis in, in uh, women. So the top line is comparing men versus women, the prevalence. So before uh, children go through puberty, MS is actually pretty evenly affecting boys and girls. However, we see once a woman goes through puberty, the rate of uh, prevalence of multiple sclerosis increases significantly, and it kind of balloons up, starting to balloon up shortly after a girl goes through puberty. And we see that kind of in prevalence of multiple sclerosis kind of stay elevated until women go through menopause, where the prevalence starts to equal up, back out again. Now, one of the things we notice on the second line is that we kind of look at the rates of relapse or kind of disease activity. And once again, the disease is typically less active prior to puberty, but once a woman goes through puberty, the rate of relapse increases significantly until she goes through menopause. Now, that rate decreases during pregnancy typically, but outside of that window, essentially women have more active or more inflammatory disease. Um, when it comes to progression, it looks like, for the most part, up until menopause, the disease seems to be less progressive in women than it does um, in particular men. So, you know, going to some fertility questions, do, if you have MS, can you get pregnant? And the answer is yes. So far, overall, there have been some studies that may suggest that there may be some factors that may suggest women may have difficulty getting pregnant. But looking at a kind of societal level, there is no effects to the fertility, or fertility um, rate with MS patients versus not. 
So some of the things that we think that may affect fertility in patients with MS is they may have lower libidos, higher certain hormones that are produced by the brain, FSH and LH, a lower estrogen levels um, in the early menstrual cycle, uh, higher instant rates of hyperprolactinemia and hyperandrosism that can also decrease um, ovulation. And they also have an increased rate of an anti mullerian hormone, which is a marker of ovarian reserve. Essentially, there's also appears to be a higher rate, as, as I said, a uh, menstrual cycle that does not re um, resolve in an egg being released. So for the most part, most of the drugs that we commonly use today do not really affect fertility. So one of the drugs that uh, Dr. Eubanks mentioned, um, minazantrone or divantrone, does, did appear to affect um, fertility. Cyclophosphamide that really isn't typically used much in multiple sclerosis can also have an effect. And then there's um, some studies that may suggest that natalizumab maybe in animals may have affected fertility, but since then studies in humans have not really demonstrated that it has affected fertility significantly. So for the most part, most of the drugs that are used to treat multiple sclerosis these days does not appear to affect a woman's likelihood to ultimately get pregnant. Um, one of the things to note is if a woman is having difficulty getting pregnant with multiple sclerosis, there are some techniques uh, that are used in intervitreal fertilization or IVF that essentially can transiently increase the risk of relapse. So if you're thinking about uh, doing IVF, it's something to talk with your neurologist and your fertility specialist to potentially come up with a strategy to help you reduce the risk, particularly if the cycle is not successful. A lot of people, you know, when just thinking about having children, they always wonder essentially what are the odds that my child will get this? And for the most part, the odd, the risk is about, you know, anywhere from one to 4%, around two to 2.5% with one patient with um, M or one parent with MS and 31% with two parents. So to put that 2% uh, percent number in perspective, if you, um, played the odds, you would have to have roughly 50 children to expect one of them to develop multiple sclerosis. So most people aren't having 50 children, but, you know, and that should be somewhat reassuring that although it can happen, it's not a very common thing. Um, generally, when it comes to deciding when you want to get pregnant, a lot of times we do recommend stopping therapies. And for the most part, um, we recommend roughly five half-lives that corresponds to most drugs to two to six weeks um, washout period. Now for some drugs we're at the point where we may not recommend a washout period anymore just because we've gathered more information over time. One of the drugs that has a particularly long elimination uh, pro, um, uh, long half-life is teraflutamide or Abagio which if you do not take a rapid elimination protocol it will stay in your body for up to 24 months. So some agents that we don't bother washing out anymore are glutamiracetate or capaxone or the interferons, which would be essentially Rebif, Avonex, Pelagrity, or beta -Ceron. Um, They appear to be, there's enough data that suggests that they are, appear to be safe in the first trimester and they also appear to be safe with breastfeeding. There's a growing body of literature that would suggest that we, depending on how active a person's multiple sclerosis is, it may be safer to continue a person on natalizumab versus discontinuing it. Um, you know, whenever we try to, whenever someone's trying to get pregnant, we try to minimize the amount of symptomatic medications that may be things like antidepressants, anti-numbness um, and tingling medications, or um, antispasmodics like baclofen or tizanidine just because a lot of people try to minimize the amount of drug exposures, but I wouldn't necessarily stop anything cold turkey before I talk to my provider. Um, additionally, um, you know, when it comes to half-lives, as I said before, I'm sorry for the repeat slide. Um, when you're trying to conceive, you know, it's always a risk versus benefit. Classically, we would want most people to have their disease controlled for roughly uh, um, one year prior to pregnancy. So one of the main things that, you know, really predicts how likely you are to have a relapse during pregnancy and why you're trying to get pregnant is how active your disease was the year before. 
know, a study suggests that essentially it can take up to seven months for someone to become pregnant with multiple sclerosis. And if we're taking someone off a disease modifying therapy, you know, that could put people that are particularly active at risk of having a relapse. So it's one of those things that's always kind of balancing the risk of benefits versus the risk of relapses. Fortunately, you know, will you get Will you have a relapse during pregnancy? And for the most part, this is a very old study um, that suggests that the rate of relapse goes down profoundly in pregnancy um, and rebounds the first three months after. So for each trimester you're pregnant, your rate of relapse goes down significantly. If you look at it overall, um, women will roughly have the same number of relapses uh, whether they got pregnant in a year versus whether they didn't get pregnant in a year. So it doesn't ultimately affect the relapse rate if a woman chooses to get pregnant. Uh, another question people will commonly have is, can I be treated if I have a relapse? And the answer is yes. Typically we do try to avoid it in the first trimester if we can because there has been some reports of an increase of birth, low birth weight or cleft palate. Most of the time we'll treat with steroids. Steroids can't be used. We can use something called IVIG. Um, how does pregnancy affect long-term disability? And I'd say that uh, there, have been, um, there have been no studies that suggest having a baby or becoming pregnant and having a child ultimately leads to worsening progression. There have been a few studies that suggest that women who have a child um, after they get diagnosed with multiple sclerosis or particularly have two, essentially may have a less aggressive course over time. Um, you know, some of those studies are limited by the fact that it could be a chicken and egg thing where women who are more healthy are more likely to have children versus uh, those who are not as healthy will have less. But, you know, there is some data to suggest that, you know, having a pregnancy after you're diagnosed could be a beneficial thing. Um, Will it make the pregnancy more difficult? And essentially, there's no increased um, there's no, no increased risk of pregnancy loss, stillbirth, or fetal malformations from the general population. Um, will it make the labor more challenging? And the answer could be. So there are some times where women with multiple sclerosis, particularly those affected by high fatigue, may run into issues of fatiguing during labor. So therefore, there could be a higher use of forceps or operative delivery. And there is a trend towards an increased rate of C-sections. Um, so should you breastfeed? The answer is it appears to be beneficial if you exclusively breastfeed to the point that you're suppressing your period. There is some data that may suggest, um, though small, that it could help reduce your risk of a postpartum relapse. Um, once again, you know, there's other health benefits to breastfeeding, so we would encourage women to breastfeed um, if they wanted to, and there would only be a few situations where we might caution against it. So fortunately, there's been a lot new, of new data that came out. This is from a, a recent article uh, from Continuum, it's a neurology magazine, and this was also presented at AAN that appears that the injectable therapies, so capaxone, um, interferons, appear to be safe in the uh, breastfeeding woman. And it looks like a lot of the monoclonal antibodies, so tosabri, nalizumab, uh, ocrelizumab, ofatubumab, um, they appear to not necessarily have a high concentration in breast milk. And additionally, they don't necessarily are, they're not orally available. So the data is starting to suggest that some of the higher potency monoclonal antibodies or infusion therapies may be safe in a uh, breastfeeding woman. But, but once again, that'd be something that I would talk with your neurologist and your obstetrician about. <laughs> Um, typically, as soon as you're done breastfeeding, whatever agent you're on, we would typically recommend restarting once you're done breastfeeding. Uh, I should have mentioned in the last slide, I did have the exception of oral medications. We do not necessarily recommend breastfeeding on any of those because once again, those can concentrate in the breast milk and they are absorbed orally in your stomach and also the baby's stomach, so they wouldn't necessarily be good. So I'm getting to the end of my presentation. I know I kind of skipped over a few things, but if anyone has any questions, please put them in the tap and I'd be delighted to answer any of them. Thanks so much, Dr. Andy. Uh, that was excellent and a lot of uh, data to cover in a short amount of time. For, so thank you for that update. Um,
one of the questions that was entered into the chat um, was asking about uh, decreased libido and what thoughts you might have on um, if somebody comes to you and they have decreased libido, what could be done to help that? So decreased libido is a, a very hard issue because a lot goes into libido. And sometimes worsening depression can um, essentially cause worsening de libido or increased fatigue can do that. Ironically enough, some of the medications we use to treat depression can also worsen libido. So a lot of times it's a multifactorial process. And sometimes, you know, we can kind of look at medications. We can also kind of, you know, discuss there's, um, unfortunately, we have a great resource in Tracy pra um, Paxton, who has helped a lot of my patients find therapists that specialize in sexual dysfunction. And sometimes, you know, patients can learn techniques that can potentially help uh, their not only libido, but also their enjoyment of those activities. That's great. So it sounds like it's a complex topic and a lot to tease out from a standpoint of whether it's other symptoms affecting it or the medications that we have them on for other reasons. Um, and, you know, one funny thing that I heard one time at a talk, it was actually a, a women in MS event for uh, women who have MS. And there was a really wonderful OBGYN and she made the point that her first question when somebody comes in and tells her that they, they have decreased libido is, do you love your partner? And then um, she said, because she doesn't have a pill for love. And so sometimes it's not even the MS itself, but it might be the relationship. And so it's really you know, important to, to investigate not only within the person experiencing the low libido, but also um, psychosocially, what else may be going on. Um, but certainly there are a lot of ways to address that. Um, so with the time that we have left, I wanted to just um, uh, thank uh, all of the uh, MS physicians who are here today. Um, Dr. Doug Wu, thank you so much for being here and, and talking about such important symptoms with fatigue and sleep. And Dr. Eubank, thank you for the uh, updates in progressive MS. And uh, Dr. Andy, thank you so much for covering uh, such an important topic uh, for women with MS and their loved ones. Um, and uh, Lauren uh, Esposito uh, and colleagues over at Neuro Wellness, um, thank you so much for all that you do. Uh, for everyone who joined us today, um, please reach out, let us know um, your thoughts about today's event. Uh, if you have other topics that you would hope we would cover in future um, presentations, we'd love to hear that. We'll plan to have our next one coming up in the fall. And um, we thank you so much for your time and attention and enjoy the rest of your weekend.